America's number one show on pop culture and politics. This is the Michael Medved Show. And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth and a great day and a great week to celebrate a great opening. What kind of great opening? Uh, Not so much for any movie in particular, though Despicable 2, Despicable Me 2, was a huge success around the world, but some other kind of success that's even more deserving. Uh, My friend Stephen Meyer has a new book you've heard about on this show before. It is called Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Uh, Stephen Meyer's book debuted as the seventh best-selling nonfiction book in the country on the prestigious New York Times bestseller list. It's an amazing achievement. Uh, This is our Science and Culture Hour for this week with the Discovery Institute. Stephen, of course, a senior fellow at Discovery and head of their Center for Science and Culture. Okay, Dr. Meyer, you've written this book. It's readable. It's important. It is mind-opening and mind-bending. What... um, What do you think explains the fact that uh, already this book, which people, by the way, can uh, find out all about at our website at michaelmedved.com, what do you think explains this phenomenal popularity? Well, I think it's really something that's been building for a long time. That is the interest in this issue. It's a scientific issue, and as we've talked about before, it's a scientific issue that has larger implications for the big questions that people care about. Is there a design behind the universe, behind life, or are we the result of unguided, strictly material processes? And we've had a number of very successful uh, books and videos and films over the years coming out of Discovery Institute and the network of scientists that are championing the, the case for intelligent design. And I think all th- this book is just kind of drafting behind all that interest that's been created over the years. Plus, we've had a terrific effort from the good people at Harper, the publisher of the book, and the uh, the, the staff and, and my colleagues at Discovery Institute who have done a great job getting the word out. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. And as you know, Stephen Meyer is not afraid nor am I to take people who think this is all hooey, it's hogwash, it's ridiculous, uh, Darwinism is revealed truth, uh, there is no chance to question it at all, any questioning of it is uh, equal to knuckle-dragging, tobacco juice-spurting, <laughs> uh, low-grade m- moronism. Is there such a word as moronism? I don't know. Troglodytes. Uh, troglodytes yeah. is always a good word. Yeah. The, 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 remember the Trogs, the band from the 60s? I think that's a, <laughs> the Trogs were uh, – troglodytes, for those who don't know, were cavemen. And uh, yes, uh, no, there, this goes beyond – Isn't it? wouldn't it be interesting that they would say that people who believe in intelligent design – are troglodytes or cavemen? Ironic, and we also get called uh, creationist in cheap tuxedos, and all, all, <laughs> we know them all. They're just all kinds of great epithets. So. Do you do you own a tuxedo? I do, but it's not cheap. Okay, so. I, yeah, I don't own a tuxedo. One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six. The other thing that's very interesting in the world of intelligent design and some of these profound questions is this review, and it is a fascinating review and a prominently featured review in The New Yorker. Has The New Yorker signed on to ID, Intelligent Design? Well, not not at all, but uh, I was really, in a way, flattered by their, uh, their interest in the book and that they would choose to review it so quickly right out of the shoot, I thought was... Uh, it was pretty exciting in its way. So, um, well, they're, they're it, treating it shows this, that the issue has, has become a major cultural issue. They're treating this as an important literary event, which it is. I mean, to debut on the New York Times bestseller list is an amazing thing. For people who, by the way, want to read uh, some of uh, Stephen Meyer's book and get the gist of his arguments, you can do that for free. No, I'm serious. You can do it for free. You can go uh, right to the science and culture update icon on our website at michaelmedved.com, and you can download a free excerpt of Darwin's Doubt. Uh, You can do that also directly at darwinsdoubt.com, and that's without an apostrophe, the website, darwinsdoubt.com. And uh, you can go ahead and download that now. Now, for people who do that, let's just go over very quickly the the essence of what you're talking about, because what you're talking about, and the New Yorker writes about this, goes back to a discovery on a Canadian railroad, which was better than what happened with Canadian railroads this weekend, where a runaway train wiped, wiped out a town. 
Um, yeah, I know Runaway Train wiped out a movie studio with the Lone Ranger movie, but that's another story. Okay, basically, they're railroad workers. They're digging in Canada, and what do they find? Well, it wasn't actually the, the railroad workers opened up the, the area, but it's a place up in British Columbia, high in the Canadian Rockies. And there was a, an American geologist, uh, Charles Walcott, who was uh, looking for fossils in 1909. And he, at the very end of the, the season, found this amazing trove of Cambrian era fossils that uh, that exacerbated a mystery that was already a mystery going back to Darwin's time, which was the mystery of the origin of the first animal life. And what the the British Shale documented was that the explosive origin of animal life of which Darwin knew was even more explosive than Darwin knew. And Walcott was uh, became a very famous paleontologist because of excavation of all these extraordinarily complex creatures that appeared in the fossil record from the very dawn of animal life. And, and what's important about this is Darwin taught that uh, evolution has to be slow. It doesn't occur all of a sudden. Things go very, very gradually that a, a, a little tiny a piece of a feather will be uh, evolved before the wing is, is evolved or equipped. Isn't that the basic it, it, exactly. idea? Exactly. His mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations, and we would now talk about random mu mutations as a form of variation, must work very gradually and slowly. It's the, the, he said that the, the variations are small and incremental, and he thought they had to be because if they were large and sudden, uh, uh, there would be all kinds of terrible uh, mutant forms that would arise that would be deleterious and would stop the evolutionary process in its tracks. So he envisioned the evolutionary process as being necessarily an event that would work very, very gradually, and yet the first major forms of animal life appear in the fossil record very abruptly, very suddenly or discontinuously. And and uh, the New Yorker basically says, hey, it wasn't an explosion. It took uh, a million years. Right. Well, they're actually playing semantic games there because there are a number of different events in the, that recorded in the fossil record. And if you include not just the main pulse of innovation that occurs in the fossil record in the Cambrian, but you also include events that occur after that, you can stretch it out. But there, uh, the, and if you go back into the Precambrian, where there's some odd creatures that have real, no real connection to the Precambrian, you can also make the Cambrian explosion longer if you want to call it that. But the actual, the the the, the engineering problem, if you will, is how to build these animals as quickly as they arise. And there's a seam of rock all around the world, and the the best find now is in China. And there are 13 to 16 major phyla, the, the biggest groups of animals, that arise in a 5 to 6 million year window. It's not a 30 million, 30 million year window as the uh, New Yorker intimated. So it's, uh, it's very sudden geologically, and it turns out that it's very sudden biologically, because, again, because of the time that the Darwinian mechanism needs to work. I have a couple chapters in the book that examine the mathematical requirements or <laughs> examine mathematically what would be required to generate uh, the amount of, of form and structure that arises. And I show that even generating a few coordinated mutations, uh, and this is using the, the, uh, the Darwinian math, the mathematical expression of Darwinian theory that comes from a discipline of evolutionary biology called population genetics, that, that the Darwinian math shows that there's not enough time to, to generate even a few coordinated mutations in the time scale of the entire time that life has been on Earth. And so something as radical and innovative as all these new animal forms could certainly not have been a, a, a produced in 5 to 10, 10 million years or even the 30 million years that the, uh, that the New Yorker is saying is uh, the, the, the correct figure. So it's, it's a moot point either way, but it's an incorrect figure. I was engaged in an argument, as I know you are all the time, on this subject, and someone brought up about the Cambrian explosion. Uh, how can you claim that that was the work of an intelligent designer? Most of those animals don't even exist anymore. Well, the the, uh, the the question is essentially the question of the origin. And m many of the animals and the animal forms have existed right to the present. Some have gone extinct. Um, one of my favorite Cambrian forms is the comb jelly, which in 530 million years has evolved not a bit. We have the same basic form with us today. But um, Comb jelly? Yeah, yeah, we have them out in Puget Sound. Uh, but the, uh, the, the amazing... Uh, thing about the Cambrian is, or the, the challenging thing about the Cambrian is explaining how the forms originated. 
and the the uh, the argument that I make for intelligent design is not based on is, is not just a critique of neo Darwinism. It's based on some of the features that are present in animal forms when they arise. One of which it, now we now know is information. The Cambrian explosion wasn't just an explosion of of form, it was an explosion of information. And what we know from experience is that information always comes from an intelligent agent. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. We're speaking with Dr. Stephen Meyer about his brand new bestseller, debuted and number seven on the New York Times bestseller list. You can help it uh, move even higher uh, by going to michaelmedved.com, clicking on the science and culture update icon, or by giving us a call. And engaging in conversation about whether it even matters whether life was designed or just happened. Give us a call now. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. That's 1-800-955-1776. Twenty-one minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, uh, where you can save fifteen percent or even more on car insurance with Geico. Just go to geico.com or call one eight hundred nine four seven auto. The only hard part is figuring out which way is even easier. And Stephen Meyer is uh, in studio with us uh, for the last time in a studio that is in transition. We actually go to our brand new studios at the same radio station um, and on Wednesday, which will be an epic. Epic day for Im- improved uh, technological proficiency here on the Medved Show. And speaking of improved technological proficiency, uh, Stephen has done a fantastic job getting uh, the word out about his book, Darwin's Doubt. It is a scintillating and important read, and it has debuted as a national bestseller. And also one of the things that's striking is even the review in The New Yorker, which is kind of, I mean, basically... A, uh, a view that in no way endorses the principles of intelligent design it is a view that acknowledges that the book is serious, that it's readable. And in fact, they say scientific uh, readers will likely find that Darwin's doubt has an inspired by true events feel. Uh, that doesn't sound like a um, a, a, a rip or a, an attack. And in fact, in the review, uh, the the reviewer, uh, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning science writer for The New Yorker, acknowledges that um, that this book will continue and contribute to the ongoing conversation. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. You, um, you make a point, Stephen, that I think most people don't realize, and this gets us to the question I posed right before the break about why it matters, why this is important. That we just had a lot of talk about Thomas Jefferson because, as the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, he, of course, is always a figure on the Fourth of July. Most people think of Thomas Jefferson as a purely secular um, religious skeptic, and in some ways, he was certainly a religious skeptic, certainly skeptical about some of the claims of of Christianity. But but Thomas Jefferson actually had some points of view on this issue of intelligent design, did he not? Well, he did, and it, they were important for the founding of the country because he believed that it was possible to know by reason, not by revelation, not by by uh, biblical or uh, truth or church authority, in the reality of a of a creator. And because of that, he believed then he was then able to affirm that it's self evident that that uh, uh, we believe that we're endowed by that creator with certain inalienable rights and. He, he came to the conviction when he said that you, we could know about the, the reality of a creator by reason. He came to that conviction because of his impression, his overwhelming impression of the design of the universe. He said at one point, I hold um, that when we take a view of the universe in its parts, general or particular, it is impossible for the human mind not to perceive and understand the con- a conviction of design, consummate skill and infinite power in every atom of its composition. So the, he, he believed that there was evidence of design, therefore a designer, therefore a creator who was the basis of our, of our individual rights. There's a phrase that I, I remember from years ago by uh, Sir Francis Bacon, a, a, a contemporary or a near contemporary of Shakespeare's, who wrote that it, it stretches the imagination beyond the breaking point 
that this great starry universal frame would have no mind. It's a beautiful quote. You find, you find quotes like this in Kepler and Newton and Galileo, all the main founders of the modern scientific revolution, not only believed that uh, the universe was the, uh, the product of a mind as a, because of their religious beliefs, they also thought they were seeing evidence of it when they examined the science itself, whether it was the, the, the intricate orbits of the planets or the intricacy of, for example, the eye, or the, uh, which R Newton wrote about persuasively in his book, The Optics. N Newton was a, a, a Bible believer, wasn't he? Very not? much so a Bible believer. He and actually wrote more on the Bible than he wrote on, on science, but we know him best because of his, his uh, tremendous breakthroughs in physics. I, I know that he was extremely fluent in Hebrew and had studied Hebrew specifically to access the Hebrew scriptures directly. Let's go to uh, Paul in Pasadena, California. By the way, Newton, born on Christmas Day. I think that's right. I'm, yeah. I'm almost yeah. certain, yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul in Pasadena, yeah, California. Is, yeah. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Hi, how are you? Very well, sir. Good. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I read your book, uh, Stephen, um, probably in about a week's time. It was very, very informative and very, very, very helpful. Um, I myself am a Christian. I very much adopt the theistic model uh, for the universe. And um, one thing that I do, I don't believe in the theory of evolution, primarily because the evidence presented to me is just full of holes. Um, I don't believe in theistic evolution or naturalistic evolution by any means. Um, but one thing um, that does plague me in the fossil record um, and I was wondering if you could have a perspective on this, um, uh, if there is an intelligent designer involved, is the presence of bipel primates, primary um, Cro-Magnon man, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, um, and how do they relate to um, the modern human, and perhaps why would uh, the intelligent designer create these beings? Um. Uh, you know, I really work the other end of the time scale with the origin of the first life and the origin of animals in the very first place. But um, uh, the the fossil record in the uh, the hominid line is has been a long uh, time a point of contention. There's a lot of a lot of disagreement about it, and I and so um, I, I think there's some grounds for skepticism about some of the things that we often encounter in the textbooks. Uh, we put out a little book a year or so ago on human origins that you might find on our website and have a look at that for further investigation. Let's go to uh, Roger in Temecula, California. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Stephen Meyer of Discovery Institute. Thank you. I'll try to make it quick. Congratulations on the new studio, too, by the way. <laughs> um, God willing. Hey, um, my, I never get a good response, and maybe I don't ask the question well, and that's the problem, but evolution seems to be premised on everything progressing in some sort of advancing way. Everything that progresses, it adds on and gets better as it evolves over millions of years. Would there also not be examples of things regressing or devolving de if it's sort of a random thing? And, and is there such a thing? Well, the, classically, Darwinism and the modern neo-Darwinists would say that there's no there's no progress involved in evolution. It's just things adapting to the environment, and uh, the, whatever is fittest ends up surviving best. Uh, so, there's the notion of progress is kind of imposed on uh, the evolutionary process. Well, th but, there would be progress in the sense of things become better adapted. Always better adapted, but um, but whether one one ad adaptation from the past is any better than an adaptation in a, in a newer environment, there's no there's no value judgment as to progress. Uh, the, uh, evolutionary theory also sees things as moving generally from simple to more complex. But what's what I think is interesting, and one of the one of the challenges to the theory is that the mechanisms that we actually see at work tend to, uh, there, there are many, many examples of, of loss of form and structure. There are very few examples of any significant increase of form and structure, and that's what has to be explained. Okay, all of Darwinism is based on the idea of mutations. Uh, I want to get into this with Dr. Meyer, who's also the author of the best-selling book, Signature in the Cell. How often do mutations occur, and how often are those mutations actually beneficial? We'll be right back with Dr. That. Stephen yeah. Meyer. The Michael Medved Show. MichaelMedved.com
34 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, where it's easy to save 15% or even more on car insurance with GEICO. Just go to geico.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is even easier. And it's easy to see why Stephen Meyer's work has inspired all kinds of controversy, but also praise. Your um, your book was praised by The New Yorker as a masterwork. But they said it was a masterwork of pseudo science. Yes. By the by the way, the way Hollywood works, <laughs> you would just put on the cover of the paperback edition a masterwork, The New Yorker, <laughs> and don't put on the pseudo science part. Well, is that a, is that a fair indictment of your book? Well, it's what my uh, colleague David Klinghoffer called a backhanded compliment. But uh, uh, it well, I, I think it's an actually very interesting charge because it goes right to the heart of the issue. Why is the, that they admit the book has lots of science in it, that it's reasonable, that it's serious, but they say it's a masterwork of pseudoscience. What makes it pseudoscience? It's pseudoscience because it does not uh, yield to the rule that says that we must limit um, ourselves to strictly materialistic explanation in science. I, I, we, I argue that we're looking at evidence of the activity of a mind, and that evidence is the digital code, the circuitry, the hierarchical organization of information you see in these animals. These are all features that we know arise from one and only one kind of cause, and that, that cause is intelligence, a mind, not a material process. When you come to that conclusion, you've broken the rule of science that is known as methodological naturalism or materialism. And uh, that's what intelligent design is all about. We want to say the more fundamental rule of science is to follow the evidence where it leads not and not limit scientists, scientists to only invoking materialistic causes when you're looking at an effect that we know from experience only arises from something besides just matter in motion. 1-800-955-1776, our phone number. Just very quickly, Stephen, because I want to get on some other calls. How frequently do you have a general sense, what percentage... Uh, of organisms are born with significant mutations. I don't. I don't know about that. But you asked before the break about you um, know the role of mutations. In correct. Evolution how many? How and, and then how many mutations? Mutations are very infrequent. Extreme because because life depends on fidelity of replication. Right. So, okay. So yeah. it's 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 a, a tiny minority. And, my, and mutations are not things you want. Okay. But there's another question. It's not just the mutations. It's what kind of mutation. And one of the things I show in the book is that if you want to build a new animal form, you've got to you have to have early acting mutations. Mutations that affect the first few cell divisions visions because you've got to build a new body plan and, and and you need mutations to act early to affect enough change to build a new body plan but those are the very mutations that are not just deleterious not just harmful they're always lethal it's the problem known as embryonic lethals okay and, so so wait and also wouldn't you need for the mutation to be trans uh, transmittable to a subsequent generation it would need that same mutation would need to occur more than once wouldn't it uh it would need to occur once and then spread throughout the population, but but the kind again the kind of mutations you need just don't happen, and that's and so you can talk about mutation as kind of magic wand, but when you get to the specifics of the kind of mutations that are necessary, those early acting beneficial body plan mutations never happen. The early acting mutations are always lethal. Let's go to Bill in Phoenix. Bill, you're on the Michael Medved show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Hello. Um, uh, nice to talk to you, Dr. Meyer, uh, and thanks for having me on, Michael. I, I guess, you know, the, the question I've got is, did, did Darwin really didn't talk at all about origins of life as, as much as a, about speciation, differentiation of species? Is this, is this correct? Well, absolutely. The, the first book I wrote, Signature in the Cell, addressed a question of the, addressed the question of the origin of the first life, a question that Darwin himself never addressed, and a lot of people don't know that. His, his book attempted to explain the origin of new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms. But then there's also the question of the origin of the big new forms of life, the, the, the fundamentally new animal forms, the kinds of, uh, mutational processes or processes of variation we see in uh, in biology today result in very small scale variations like changes in the size and shape of finch beaks. 
the mechanism of mutation That's in finch sele- beaks beaks yeah right, yeah the me- mechanism of mutation and selection does not do a good job of explaining say the origin of birds in the first place so as one evolutionary biologist put it natural selection does a good job of explaining the survival of the fittest but not the arrival of the fittest the ultimate origin of fundamentally new form and structure which is what the cambrian explosion is about is something that seems to exceed the creative powers of the darwinian mechanism or the modern neo-darwinian mechanism 1-800-955-1776 our phone number the book darwin's doubt big new bestseller by dr stephen c meyer the subtitle the explosive origin of animal life and the case for intelligent design you can find out all about it at our website at michaelmedved.com or get a free downloadable excerpt of the book at darwinsdoubt.com Portions of the Michael Medved Show are brought to you in part by the Discovery Institute. To learn more, click on the Science and Culture banner at michaelmedved.com. Forty-four minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. He is the author of Darwin's Doubt, the new bestseller, subtitled The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Just to review very, very quickly, when you call somebody a mutant, and I remember that used to be an insult in junior high school when we were all taking biology for the first time. Uh, it was, you say mutant, 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 a, a, a mutant. I don't know if there's ever been a rock band called the mutants, but there probably should be. Uh, but a mutant means somebody who's missing an eye or a limb or something. So it's, it's bad. It's not a good thing. It's not considered a compliment if you're calling someone else a mutant. And yet the assumption of neo-Darwinism is that um, a mutation occurs often enough in a very positive way, and that that is then replicable. And that's replicable and and put through the entire population. You know the literature vastly, vastly better than I do. What would be the best example of an observable, in historic times, since Darwin, an observable mutation that has caught hold for any species? Uh, maybe the uh, sickle cell anemia mutation, which changes the structure of the hemoglobin molecule, which confers some immunity for uh, mal- for people who are in malaria-infested climates. It's also something that generally you don't want to have. Um, right. But it's a kind of a lesser of two evils sort of uh, change to the genetic structure and the way it's expressed with proteins. But um, yeah, the, in neo-Darwinism, mutations are viewed as the engine of innovation and creativity. Let's go to Peter in Greenville. How are you? Very well. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I mean, I'd like to remain anonymous, but I am a professor of philosophy. Um, and I'd li- like to say to the listeners, I'm, I'm neutral on this issue. Uh, there's problems with Darwinism. There's problems with intelligent design. I'm, I'm in the middle here. Um it, would it be okay if I made just a, a like a couple of quick statements before I ask the question? Uh, you probably are going to run out of time. Uh, why well, don't I'll you say them real quickly then? Okay. Just for clarification for your listeners, uh, the the fact that ev- that things evolve and change is a fact. Evolution is a is a fact of life. You can take single celled organisms and wave a magnetic field over them and watch them mutate right in front of you and things like this. So the the question is why they why they evolve and change. And, and so Darwinism is a theory of why things evolve and change. So just in the interest of clarifying the debate, a lot of people talk about, you know, evolution as a theory. E- evolution's a fact. We know things evolve. You know, horses are bigger than they used to be. Dogs are different than they're not wolves anymore. The, the second thing is, with creationism, what you're committed to is that when God created everything, they're still here in exactly the same way that he made them. I mean, it's a fixed static model. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Like, the other thing is that when you say God, when you say Francis Bacon... Wait, 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 wait. No, no, I don't. I never said such a thing. Peter, why are you bringing up creationism? Well, if if you want... Some some intelligent design... Uh, advocates are creationists, not all. So, no, it's, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a clear distinction here. And in other words, if you are, generally, if you use the term creationist, 
you believe in a biblical creation, and you have all kinds of problems like the one that you mentioned, which is uh, if God created all animal life and created all life at the very beginning the way it is now, then that you run into all kinds of problems with the fossil record. That is not the case with intelligent design, which actually does a better exp, uh, explanatory job with the fossil record than neo-Darwinism. I, I think the... Um Peter, your call, your, your your distinction is correct. There is a there's the the fact of evolutionary change, but the the deeper question is what causes that change? Is that produced by unguided, undirected process like an unguided, undirected process like mutation and natural selection, or is there an element of design or purpose of intelligence involved in the in the process that produced us? Intelligent design affirms the latter and denies the former or challenges the former and but we do not de- deny that uh the process of uh natural selection is real or that it produces at least small scale effects the kinds of things that you point to uh, the uh are are what are commonly termed as microevolution and uh, and so there's i think the key to this is there are different definitions of evolution and you allude to that change over time common universal common ancestry and uh, mutation and selection produce everything that we see, and that's the meaning of evolution, that intelligent design is challenging that third meaning. Peter, get to your question right now. Another question real quick? Yes, go to your question. Okay. Okay, well, when we use this word mind, like the ancient Greeks, like the philosopher Anaxagoras had a word, uh, nous, which you know meant consciousness. In other words, there's consciousness all around us. So when you say God, you say Francis Bacon believed in God. And I Jesus didn't say that. Is- Hello? I didn't say that. He used the term mind. Oh, oh I know. I'm, I'm, please, let me just finish. I'm, I'm neutral here. What I'm saying is that <laughs> well, if we use mind or God or something, that does not necessarily... Everyone, in other words, it's an, it's an empty concept. Everyone will fill it in with what they think. They think, oh, he's talking about my God or my... But, you know, the God of Jefferson and the God of Spinoza and the God of Newton are all very different gods. And just because you believe in intelligent design doesn't mean that you all agree on what the nature of consciousness no, is. No, that's that's that, that's exactly that's exactly right, but I don't think the nation the notion of consciousness is an empty concept. Uh, we all have direct introspective experience of what it means to be a conscious and rational agent, to be a mind. And what I'm arguing for is that what we see in the history of life are indicators of the activity of mind, and we those and those are the things that we see that are indicators because of what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning. That um, that uh, th- these are indications of what we know only minds can produce. So if we see digital code and we see an explosion of digital code, we know from experience that only minds produce such thing. We can infer that a mind was at work. Then the question as to who that mind was is a, is a question for subsequent philosophical reflection. When uh, we come back, I want to get into what the real argument is. The real argument here is not between people who believe there is a universal mind and people who believe there is a god. The real argument is between people who believe there is either a universal mind or a god and people who believe there's only materialism. We'll be right back. The Michael Medved Show. MichaelMedved.com Fifty-five minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, to get back to this essential argument, the argument about creationism, intelligent design, neo-Darwinism, the point, and Stephen, I I think it's an important one, I'd love you to speak on this, because it's so crucial that people understand this. You don't have to believe in God to believe in intelligent design, Uh, but uh, if you do believe in in uh, neo Darwinism, you do not believe there is a directed form in the universe. That there is a universal intelligence. In other words, the unbridgeable divide is between either creationism or intelligent design and neo Darwinism. It's not between creationism it's, it's, and intelligent it's design. The, an, the philosophy professor is correct. It goes right back to the ancient Gr- Greeks. Is it mind first, and then a pre existing mind shaping matter, or is it matter first? arranging itself as a result of its own intrinsic uh, prop- properties and, of and self-organization. And see, this is something, and it's in your writing, and not just here, but in your writing over a career. This is what is extraordinary. Consciousness is such a miracle. 
when you think about it. I mean, the idea that we're having this conversation, I'm seeing this, and we're alive, and we're doing all this. No one can explain consciousness. It's it's it, it, absolutely it's a miracle. But how did do, how does that uh, come out of dead rock? Because it doesn't evolve. Because rocks don't evolve. There, there's there's there is no materialistic account for the origin of consciousness. So mind first. Mind first. Maybe that's a good title for the next one. Yeah, there, there we go. Now, I, and I should, I should hasten to add, I mean, I believe in God. I know you believe in God. But the scientific argument I'm, not, I'm making is not as the New Yorker characterized it, you know, that this was a God of the gaps argument. I'm arguing for the uh, activity of an intelligent agent of a mind because of the evidence we see in the natural world. Once you have gotten to that conclusion, you are then free to deliberate uh, as to, to the nature of that mind and, and, and who that, that agent might be. But the scientific evidence gets you at least to the, the conclusion that there must have been a mind or an intelligence involved because what we see in the history of life are, are attributes or features that are only produced by, by intelligence, and, and that's what we know from experience. And the the kind of God that you come to from some of the scientific investigations, I mean, I, I think of this with some of the the recent developments and breakthroughs in physics, where people are talking about alternate universes. I mean, it is so far beyond any simple materialistic explanation. And also, you can say it's far beyond a, a very limited, caricatured religious explanation. If anything, all of these discoveries of, of uh, the, the mind in control of the universe as the designer of this incredibly elaborate code makes God seem even more awesome. Would you agree? I, I think so. But I think it, and the evidence I'm looking at in biology is only a part of it because you also have the evidence of the fine-tuning of the laws in, of physics and chemistry, which I think point to a designing mind from the, acting from the very beginning of the universe. Stephen Meyer, the author, the book Darwin's Doubt, already a bestseller, help make it even more so. Go to michaelmedved.com, click on the science and culture icon. Stephen, congratulations on your contributions to this greatest nation on God's green earth. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2013. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.